are lots of old familiar faces to most of travel, but uh, there are lots and lots of new faces. And to that, I can only attribute our speaker, Helen. <laughs> and we welcome Helen. Helen is a native of Tulipara, and she teaches in Dublin. And her new book is just about to come out. I think you'll find flyer on a lot of the chairs. And Helen will probably tell you more about that later in details of where you can get into the price and all that. But this is our fourth uh, series in the Tipperary People and Places lecture series. Today it has been a great success. And if tonight is anything to go by, the fourth series is going to be as good. And towards the end of the night, I'll give you details of some of the other lectures that are coming uh, later on in the series. But now, uh, thank you for your patience while we brought in the extra chairs. And not to hold you any further, I hand it over now to Helen. Really where the poorest of the poor lived. 
And the fact that these comprised over half the houses in the parish just gives you an idea of how poor the people were really. Now there were of course some first class houses um, scattered throughout, few in the village and the majority of them being in Balamaki, and that would be where most of the local landed gentry lived. So it wasn't surprising that that's where those were. Um, living conditions, well for the neighbouring class who made up the bulk of the population, these were pretty terrible. And in the 1830s, the local doctor, Dr. Charles Burns, described them. And I have to give a quotation from what he said just there, and I'll let you read it yourselves. Now, if anyone can't read it, just maybe put your hand to it and read it out there. And um, speaking of the labouring classes, clothes scanty, food dry potatoes, those even scarce in summer. In general, bedding most miserable, dirty and deficient. The common covering consists of the day clothes. Furniture, a pot, an apology for a table, a stool and two sticks fastened in the wall as a bedstead. Ventilation studiously avoided, comforts not even thought of. So that case is seen pretty accurately for you. Um, despite this, they were described generally as being healthy, but bouts of cholera were common throughout the area. Now alcohol itself played um, a huge part in life at the time. Dr. Boren said again, it appears to be the general rule not to leave the towns, markets, or fairs sober, Sundays most especially. The great number of public houses all open on Sundays much facilitate the habit. So not a lot has changed in some respects. <laughs> um, however, there were class differences between the standard of living for those poor, you know, the poor labouring class and the wealthier classes. Um, Accounts of events, of events in local papers, such as uh, local picnics attended by the age of the neighbourhood, an advertisement for luxury items like parlour and toilet rolls, silk umbrellas, etc. These were obviously directed towards the welfare in the area, but this is a world apart from um, life for the majority. Now, for, for its time, education in Tulubar was quite good. About 25% of the parish were literate, and 22% could read. So in comparison to other areas, this was pretty standard. Um, there was three schools in the parish in 1841, and this was a big improvement on 20 years previously. There had only been one school, and attendance had um, increased threefold from those levels as well. So it was doing well in that area. And there obviously was some people in the area with money. In a short number of years before the famine, of course, there was three chapels built in Tumibara. One of those was even, um, as people would know it now, was Town Church. This would have been substantially contributed to by the local Count Dalton, but the other two were in Valerie and Bertagari, and the parishioners would have contributed you know, a substantial amount of money towards the building of those. Um, agriculture then would have been the main livelihood for people. In 1841, about 73% of families recorded it as their uh, main livelihood. And there would have been a small amount of other employment in the area. Jobs associated with normal country and village life, um, blacksmiths, shopkeepers, publicans. As well as that, there was five mills in the parish, which was quite an unusually high number. Now, the landowners, uh, there were most of the landowners of Tullibarra, they were absentee for the most part. Uh, the coal boards of Bones Court Estate in County Court, the Tollers, George Fawcett, um, of the Ottawa case of Temple Derry, Count Dalton of Grimmonstown, there's just a few of them. The Ottawa Caves and Count Dalton, those were the only ones who had a residence in or near Tullibarra, and they would have spent some of the year there. Now, the Reverend Massey Dawson, he's the one you hear most about throughout the evening. Um, his main estate was in South Tipperary in Aberlow, but he owned um, just under 2,000 acres of land in Tullibarra. Now, if you look at the flip chart there, I just put up a couple of names because I've been mentioning a couple of names throughout the talk. And just in case you, it can get confusing, Massey Dawson being the landlord, Richard Wilson being the land agent that worked for him, and then John McDonough, who was a local man who was an under agent. But the fact that Massey Dawson wasn't by any way um, the largest landowner in Tumibara, but the land he owned included the village, so that was why he was um, important. And, uh, yeah, on the Massey Dawson estate in Tumibara, a number of years before the famine, the rent in arrears had increased hugely. By 1842, over £2,500 was owed in rent. And the solicitor for the estate, um, O'Brien Dillon, he uh, said at the time that Massey Dawson made very liberal allowances for his tenants. And he claimed the accumulation of arrears 
had not been allowed due to neglect or indulgence, but for mistake and benevolence. Now, it seems as well there was a number of middlemen in operation in the village, and that they sublet a lot of properties and collected their own rent but didn't pass it on. So this is what would have counted for some of the rent arrears on the estate books. And this would later cause more problems for the tenants. On the Cole Bowman estate in Ballamacky, um, the, the situation was replicated. The rental arrears were very high there as well. They increased threefold between 1839 and 1843. So, as you can see, there, was there were many, whoever before the famine began, weren't even able to pay their rent in, um, in the parish. Now, agriculture in the area, land would mainly have been used um, for tillage. Where leases were held, they were held from year to year. And laborers mainly survived at the Conacre system. So that was where they would have taken a cabin and a small plot of land from a farm on which they grow potatoes. Um, and they paid for this mainly by rearing and selling the pay. Now another thing in the area is there's a strong tradition of disturbances. Um, agrarian outrages had increased considerably the years before the famine. Um, this is mainly attributed though to a higher number of evictions that were occurring. And even in the 1830s, a branch of the Tipperary Society for the Prevention of Outrage and Maintenance of the Peace was formed. Another thing was faction fighting. That was quite common throughout the area. And uh, a local man, Thomas Tracy, who you hear me mention throughout the evening, he was um, a local national school teacher, but he was around 14 or 15 at, when the time of the famine began. And later in 1906, he wrote a short account of the famine and his life. And his granddaughter, Dina, who's here this evening, kindly allowed me to use his work as one of my sources for the study. So I'll just be using a few of his quotations throughout the evening. And um, he recalled numerous groups in the area who would have traditionally fought each other in these faction fights. The two-year-olds, the three-year-olds, the Whitefoots and the Blackfoots. So any of you here from Tony Barr, some of those names won't be too unfamiliar to you. Um, now Thomas Tracy, he described one of the bigger faction fights that he had witnessed in his youth. And uh, that was the quotation there. I'll just read it out as well. I had seen a faction fight of 200 men at each side. The poor fools were drawn up opposite each other, perhaps about 100 yards asunder, and at a signal from the heads rushed to meet. Though it was melancholy to witness the scene, it was laughingly enjoyed by neutrals and members of the government. Such flying of sticks, cracking of heads, shouts and huzzahs, much resembling an Indian meeting of foes. It was usual for the heads to ply their followers with an amount of bad whiskey. The combat was continued till one party gave away. So a good Sunday afternoon's entertainment. Um, so overall, as you can see, on the eve of the famine, the situation was, you know, fairly bleak in Tumibara. There was a hugely expanding population, and the housing standard was very poor for the majority. Living conditions falling for the labouring class who made up the majority of the, of the population and a high rate of disturbances locally, with a very high dependence on agriculture as well. So I'll just move on to the beginning of the famine itself. Now the first signs of blight reported were in mid-October 1845, and throughout the poor law union of Nina, the extent of the damage varied between localities and you know, even within localities. Thomas Tracy wrote that year that the leaves withered, and when the tubers were being dug, they were found to be partly of black heart patches, quite useless as a food. I saw them grated by the poor people and sought to be made into potato bread. No use. They could not sustain life and disease setting. So Tumigara fell under the administration of Nina Poor Law Union and representatives from each area in the union known as Poor Law Guardians were elected um, each year. They were typically larger farmers or maybe local landed gentry. And by, 18, by, early, by early 1846, 22 local relief committees had been set up within the union of the Porla Union of Nina. And almost all of Tumivara fell under the Balamaki Relief Committee or the Tumivara Relief Committee. And the membership of those made up mainly of landed gentry, larger farmers and clergy. And the main role of the committees was to buy corn from the government and sell it at cost to the destitute in the area. As well they oversaw local relief they oversaw local relief works and they raised subscriptions locally as well to provide funding for relief. And most of the subscriptions that they would have raised um, were from local landed gentry as well, large tenant farmers, merchants and clergy. And of the records that have survived, it shows that while many did contribute, there were many also who weren't listed who would have had the means to do so. Father John Mamer, he was the local parish priest at the time, 
and he was joint secretary of both the Balamaki and the Tumi Barra Relief Committee. He subscribed £10 himself to each of the committees. He would be one of the largest subscribers. So up to September then of that year, the first year really, that each committee had raised between £70 and £115. And then they received a government donation of a similar amount to match what they had raised to help with relief in the area. So by late spring, they started selling an Indian meal to the poor of the parish. But by August, all the committees, that, well, the main two, to Mivara and Balamaki, but also the Kikiri by the clock committee, so Kikiri would have fallen under them, they were all operating at a loss. And the numbers they support, they were supporting varied. By the end of the summer, the Tumivara Committee were leaving about 25% of its po district population, and the Kilkiri Badman Club Committee were leaving about 43%. So that was a very high dependence on relief, even at that early, rate, early stage in the plan. Um, as well as this, they provided local employment for the poor so that they would have some money then to buy food. And some of the jobs that they had uh, going were whitewashing houses in the village making shores and quarrying flagstones and working on roadside dikes. And in addition to the local relief works, the uh, public, works, public works were set up in Tumibara. And these works involved road improvement, building new roads, and in a couple of cases, lowering hills as well. The workers at the time were paid about anywhere between four and eight pence a day. This is where the <coughs> that opponents of the public works and um, were paying and being paid. Now, even within the Tumibara area, there were some irregularities reported in the organisation of the works. In order to get a place on them, you had to get a ticket authorised by someone from the committee. And tickets were being issued by different members of the committee, but their signatures were all written by the one person in the same handwriting. So the Relief Commission got wind of this anyway and issued an order that it was to be stopped. So overall, in the first year, um, relief measures were generally considered to be successful. Not too many excess deaths or no excess deaths are ever reported, and the works were due to the relief efforts was due to end in August when the new potato crop would become available. However, as you would know, the potato crop again was a complete failure. And in order to deal with that, the local relief committees reassembled in autumn to deal with the crisis. So at this stage now, facing into the second year, the situation was deteriorating rapidly for local people. The vast majority of labourers were unemployed. And in September, Father Mamber, who was the parish priest, he complained to the Relief Commission that there were no public works in the immediate vicinity, and he urged that a meal depot be set up. He said, the people are in a deplorable condition, many of them living on cabbages. He said they would soon have no choice but to starve or rob. And around this time as well, reports started to appear in local papers of you know, animals being killed in fields and their carcasses being carried away for food. Catholic baptism rates in the parish declined by 22% that year, so just showing how much the famine in the previous year had impacted on you know, normal life. Um, the relief committees continued to try and raise subscriptions, and by the end of that year they had raised a further £126 to help relieve um, the poor of the locality. Now, new public work schemes began in the late autumn time, and at this stage local labourers were desperate to earn money to buy food, with very little labour and employment available in the area. But the wages being paid were very low, and food prices that winter increased hugely, so really it went nowhere near allowing people to support their families. Um, even within the schemes, again, there were reports of irregularities. Out of 40 men who were authorised for public works at Kilkiri, 17 didn't turn up. And in February, the inspecting officer found in Tumibara that out of nine people listed for stone breaking work, three were doing other work, and one sent a substitute in his place. So, while it's obvious that there were many people suffering at the time, there were many playing the system as well. That September then, there was a meeting to uh, discuss further public works, and many of the unemployed around attended, but as well the county surveyor, local justices, clergy, all, they all came as well. They came up with an optimistic plan to apply for a thousand pounds to set up public works in the area. Um, but this was later rejected because of compensation claims made by landowners whose land would be affected. Now, there were some works um, authorised for the area. These included a hill being north of Carrie Dawson, a bridge being built on the road between Tumipara and Runnanore, and gullets being built around the parish at four different locations. So, by the spring, then, the following spring of 1847, food prices started to decrease a little, but it was too late for many at that stage. As part of the Poor Law Extension Act, any person with more than a quarter of an acre of land was denied relief. This was a death knell to the huge labour population in Tumibara. Many of them at this stage then were facing a choice between 
staying in their homes and starving, or else giving up their holdings in order to become eligible for relief. As well, the catastrophe of 1846 had meant that well, they hadn't even enough potatoes to eat, so they certainly hadn't enough left to plant um, for the following year. So even though the crop of all from 1847 was generally healthy, it didn't really make much of a difference to many of them. It was reported at the time that destitution was daily increasing and employment diminishing, with nearly every electoral division in the Union being overrung with paupers. And Tom Stracy remarked that in Tumibara, it was not till 47 that the real climax of famine came. The soup kitchen was set up in the village to feed the hungry, but this was closed a number of months later after that. So, at that stage, there were some receiving relief, and while they may have been considered lucky to receive it, the quality of what they were getting is often very questionable. Meal which was given to the destitute by the Balamaki Relief Committee was crawling with vermin, and the people who collected to, rece to, who collected to receive it, some of them said it couldn't be used, others said they would have to use it or face starvation. Another suggested if they steeped it in water, the vermin would flow to the top. Now, as it turned out, this meal was actually being sold to the committee by a local mill owner, who happened to be a member of the Relief Committee himself. He wasn't at the meeting where this matter was discussed, but a number of the members was there and produced a letter on his behalf. And the letter was from a person in Limerick who had supplied him with the meal. And he said, with the exception of the vermin, the meal would be of excellent quality. <laughs> and he trusted that the mill owner would not meet with any inconvenience upon the matter and that the committee would excuse him. So, and the discussion uh, progressed and he was remarked that it wasn't the first time this had happened and uh, they decided to apply a new contractor to supply the meal. So by September of that year, the numbers applying for relief was increasing daily. People were getting desperate. Fever increased hugely throughout the area. And Delina Garden reported that the fever was finishing the work the famine had begun. And the problem became so severe that the Central Board of Health authorised several temporary hospitals to be set up just to treat fever patients. One of these was in Chimigara. And the hospital was to be built by a contractor from Nina, and he said it was going to take five weeks to build. But it was needed so urgently that at the time, um, Matthew Dawson's agent offered a house for free on the Palace Road, so this was to be used as a, a temporary fever hospital. And at the time, there was 58 people in the area with fever, three of whom had been sleeping on the side of the road, as reported. Now, Thomas Tracy made a comment about the hospital, and he said, it gave admittance, but only to human skeletons, spent and worn out by diseases and famine. And the running of the hospital was transferred from the local committee to the Poor Law Union that September. This just, at that time, it was obvious funds were very scarce. In November, the hospital had 80 patients, but the bread and milk contractors refused to, refused to supply any more because they hadn't been paid for what they had already supplied. Um, for the matter, the local parish priest appealed to the Board of Guardians and they made a payment to cover the cost up until November. But the hospital was closed the following April, so after that, anyone with fever would have had to go to Nina to the fever hospital there. Now, that October, things came to a head in Tumikara. It was reported that almost half of the people were destitute at that stage, and a group of 200 gathered, and they walked the seven miles to Nina to the workhouse. And they gathered at the gates, they were looking for work or outdoor relief. Now, it was reported locally that they weren't in any way violent or rowdy but there was nothing offered to them except admittance to the workhouse, which none of them wanted to take. Now, the workhouse master said to them that a new relieving officer had been appointed and he would start work the following day. And the newly appointed relieving officer was a, a Timothy O'Brien from Balabeg in Tumibara. He happened to be a brother of Morgan O'Brien, who was the poor law guardian at the time as well. And each area had a relieving officer appointed, and it was their job to meet with the local destitute and they'd assess their eligibility for relief. So at the time that those relieving officers were appointed, it was highlighted that of six of the nine were all related to guardian, poor law guardians in the union. But the crowd anyway that gathered, they were told that there was nothing available for them to accept a place at the workhouse. Um, now, Thomas Tracy wrote about the workhouse as well, and uh, his words really sum up, sum up what was thought about it. I'm going to read that one out there. Uh, the workhouses were filled from floor to ceilings, and it was such a reproach to be called a poorhouse pauper that the people suffered starvation and death sooner than enter. If a family, say as hundreds of times occurred, young father and mother with a few children entered the workhouse, 
The husband was separated from the wife and both from the children. Even the children were separated from each other according to sex. The wailings of these I hear now, many of whom when they became inmates never saw each other again. Now, two weeks after that crowd had gathered, the situation had improved um, to regard any, any bit at all, and a group of about 300 reassembled at the workhouse again. Now, this time there was they were from Tuivara, Balamaki, and some from Lantra as well, but they didn't receive anything. But this time they had five or six of the local um, larger tenant farmers with them, and they were admitted to the boardroom um, to talk to the poor dog guardians. So one of them, a Richard Coughlin from Bellamaki, he said, uh, he spoke on behalf of the group and said, the poor of the area are in a state of destitution, so they had no food or employment and were starving. And they were willing to work, but if they were to starve, they would go into the workhouse. He also warned them that the property of the well disposed of the parish was not safe, as the people would either have to plunder it and or die unless they got outdoor relief. So the crowd eventually dispersed and left. By December then, the situation in Tumibar had got worse. James Willington, he was a poor law guardian for um, Balmaki, he said, I assure you that the people in our district are in an actual state of starvation. They cannot be in a worse state. The number of baptisms that year continued to decrease as well. Many went to the workhouse gates looking for relief, but all that was offered for not admittance. A testament to how, big, how bad things really got was a request sent by the Board of Guardians to the poor law commissioners requesting that they get their permission to give coffins to the destitute who died outside the workhouse, but this was refused. Now, what didn't help the situation again were further reports of irregularities and um, people who were found to be less than industrious in their jobs. Now, the leading officer for Tumi Barra, uh, Timothy O'Brien of Balladay, he was dismissed for neglecting his post. In 18, a number of cases were reported in Tumi Barra where people who didn't really need relief were being returned as eligible for it. And a dispute arose in May when uh, John Mara Bellabeg, a virgin, was accused of obtaining meal for the use of the poor but keeping it for himself. Now he totally denied this, but the inspector of the union at the time claimed that when he, was, when he visited to Ivara, Mara had appointed a workman of his to collect the meal and take it to another place where he locked it up and wouldn't distribute it to the poor. In May, then, a public meeting was called to discuss the mismanagement of union affairs, and the relieving officer for Balamaki at the time was William Young. He was cleared of incompetency, even though reading the accounts of what was discussed, it was pretty obvious he wasn't doing the job. Moving on to 1848, the situation didn't really improve. At this stage, it was apparent that even some of the better off in the area were feeling the pressure. The poor law union were finding it quite hard to collect the rates, and um, they'd increased hugely over the previous number of years, you know, to try and uh, provide money and fund the relief effort in the area. Um, Um, so when, yeah, when the poor law union guardians were nominated, one of the conditions of eligibility was that they had to have paid their own rates. And that year in Tumi Mara, the three who were nominated didn't even qualify because they themselves had paid. And later that August, the rape collector of Anna Nathan Balamaki stole over a hundred pounds of rapes and fled to America. <laughs> Throughout that year, the desperation of the people grew worse. Thomas Tracy said, To describe the kinds of hunger I witnessed among the people is out of my power, though I have now, now being 1906, a distinct recollection, so vividly was it impressed on my mind at the time. He recalled he'd seen people trying to eat grass, nettles, turnip tops to survive. Uh, one story that was reported locally was uh, five sheep were stolen from a farmer who lived at Clash in Tumibara. But uh, the farmer, John Boyd, he had seen the two, two local men taking the sheep and reported it straight away. So the police went to their house and found that the sheep had already been killed and the meat was being cooked. Um, there was some small measure that provided by locals that was reported anyway. Um, yellow meal was given to poor people at a house in Alitrum who weren't able to afford to buy meal from the relief committee. But it's unclear how long this continued. Um, a local vet who was one of the oldest living residents, um, or the oldest living people from the parish of Tumibara, Jack Hall, he can remember his own grandfather talking about when he was a boy, when he was a boy, coming down to Tumibara with, in a pony and car with a carload of turnips and turning them out in the square for the poor people of the village to eat. So, <laughs> moving on then to uh, 1849. Now this was really to be the, the worst year for the people of Tumibara. 
There was a marked increase um, in thefts um, of money and food, sheep and animals being killed and their carcasses taken was common. In January, there was a thousand people in Tumibara destitute alone, and the outlook was bleak. At this stage, they'd already been through a number of years of starvation, fever, um, extremely limited relief. Immigration, as we said, was only an option for those who could afford to go. So the better off the landowners and larger farmers, they seem to carry on for the most part without you know, experiencing the same um, upheaval as the poorer classes. Monthly fairs and markets continued in Nina and Tumibara regularly. Now, 1849, Richard Wilson, who I just mentioned over there, he was the land agent. He had been appointed to uh, the estate from Massey Dawson as the new land agent in May the previous year. And he took on a 20-year lease of the village. And as I mentioned earlier, the space was in a serious state of rental arrears at that time, with over two and a half thousand pounds old. And we know this was partly due to the middlemen, but a lot of people were in genuine arrears as well. Wilson had taken all this on, and um, his solution was to sort it out was to evict the tenants and clear the place. And this all came to a head on the 24th of May with the arrival of the Crowbar Brigade. So, Thomas Tracy recalled, the times were very bad and some men were willing to perform menial offices for money under the name of the Crow, or as they were called, the Crow Bar Brigade. These came out from Nina, escorted and guarded by the police and military, and in the early morning commenced their crew work. <coughs> so that morning, about 60 police left Nina and arrived in Tumi Bar around 9 o'clock, whereupon they started evicting tenants and clearing the cabins and houses. Now, obviously, it, there would be some warning beforehand that was going to happen. <coughs> A reporter from the Tipperary Vindicator, which is a local newspaper, um, was in Tumi Bar on the day, and he said that the clearing had been put off from the Wednesday. Now, I just the map that I showed you earlier there, I just put that up again for 84, <coughs> just so you can see where I'm talking about. Um, the reporter for the Vindicator said that the tenants that lived between Father Mapper's house up as far as Mrs. Hill's coach office, so that's here from just beyond uh, the Silver Mines Cross, right up to where the chemist is in Tully Bar, right the square right now. They had thrown down their houses by arrangement because they'd obviously come to some deal that if they went along with it, they would get to keep the timber and patch themselves. Um, at the upper end of the street, so up past the Protestant church, right down to the square there, John Donoghue, now he was a local man, I mentioned that he was the under agent on the estate. Him, along with the police and bailiffs, um, evicted families from their houses there. And they left some of the houses and the rest of them they boarded up to make sure the families couldn't get back in. Um, the bailiffs then they moved on to Main Street, so just where the square is there, and right up onto Main Street. And here they took possession of houses and began clearing out the tenants as well. Now this was obviously one of the poorer areas in the village at the time. The reporter remarked that some of the houses in this street contained four and five families, all in great destitution. They were scarcely half clad, and many of them had apparently got up from their miserable pallets of straw to go out on the road and lay their bodies in the ditch. Now, when the bailiffs were busy here, just at the, at the start of where the square was, further up the street where they hadn't reached, a local man called Andrew Gleason started breaking the windows on his own house and carrying out his furniture. This house was described as presenting an air of comfort in comparison with other houses in the village. He was going to be evicted even though he had paid him rent, and he actually produced receipts he had received from John Dunningham for his rent. But when he was in the middle of telling the reporter this, he was punched in the face by a local butcher, and the reporter later heard that the butcher was to get this man's house after he had been evicted. Um, the way was then moved on up further onto what was called Feather Street at the time, so up past the church there, and they started knocking houses there with crowbars. In one of the houses, there was a man in such bad condition he wasn't able to get up. The reporter described him as a poor creature on a wretched straw pallet in the corner. His face and limbs were swollen, scarcely able to articulate a word from excessive debility. And the sheriff's deputy, business, would give him a shilling and appointed his caretaker of his house for a week. Now, so Thomas Tracy, he was there on, on, when the clearance occurred, and this is how he described it. <coughs> it was a mournful sight. Women carrying their younger children, fathers going frantic. The cries and roars could be heard a long distance, perhaps four miles. I call now to mind the sight very clearly. Long levers were used, mostly crowbars. The underparts were undermined, and the roof fell in with a crash. Now, the reporter from the Tipperary Vindicator, he reported extensively on it, and one of his main quotations, uh, I'll read that one out again there. Um, it was a, a picture.
piteous spectacle on Thursday, in the midst of the pouring rain, to see children led by their parents out from their houses into the street, to see mothers kneel down on the wet ground and holding their children up to heaven, beg relief from the Almighty and strength to endure their afflictions. The cries of bereaved women and men running half frantic through the streets are powering from the rain and wind under the shelter of their poor furniture piled confusedly about were affecting in the extreme. To see amid all this misery, ten or twelve worldly ruffians from Nina assailing the houses of crowbars, and to hear their cries of exultation as a wall yielded to their assaults, or a roof tumbled down with a crash, the spectator should be callous and could avoid being greatly affected by the scene. It was altogether as deplorable a spectacle as I have ever beheld. So in total that day, 40 to 50 houses were levelled, amounting to a total of 576 people being affected. <coughs> So about five o'clock, the clearance was finished, the bailiffs had finished their work, and at this stage the people were left with a few of their belongings, nowhere to go. Some of them gathered bits and pieces that were left from the clearance, like boxes, boards and things, and they went and put up some temporary shelters against the walls of the church, and they sheltered under those. <coughs> now that's a picture of the church that was only taken in the 1950s or that, but just to give you an idea, it was the same church. So it was against the walls of the church that they got their boards and belongings and put up their temporary shelters there. And how it was described, chairs were arranged in squares, quilts, sheets and pieces of old canvas were stretched on poles, wigwams were thus formed under whose covering the poor creatures were seated, completely saturated with the rain which fell through the flimsy awning overhead nearly as plentifully as it did from the skies without. Asses, cars and turf baskets were also upturned and gave shelter to scores of half-tied wretches. Now there wasn't enough room for all the families to put up shelters around the church and none of them were allowed on the square at the time because it was the property of the landlord. One family, the Devanis, resorted to putting up a shelter over their family grave and they actually lived there until they moved to Money Gaul later that year. Now, the people didn't blame Massey Dawson for the clearance at all. The blame was put on Wilson, as it was his decision to undertake the clearance. And uh, Thomas Tracy said, The landlord Massey Dawson was not to blame, as the town was led to the notorious Wilson, who exercised his severity on the inhabitants. And he describes Wilson as one of the most notorious characters that ever lived, who took a devilish delight in eviction and scattering the honest, virtuous people of the village on the face of the earth. Now after that, our, the reporter returned a couple of days later and he met with many of those who were still around who had been evicted. Um, he found many of them starving and surviving in terrible conditions. And when he went up as far as the church and came across where all the huts had been erected and where people were living, this is what he said. To all the skibbereen of skull of Ballinroe, of all the black spots on the checkered map of our most ill-fated country, on all the places which have obtained a worldwide notoriety for horror, Tumivara throws them completely in the shade, because in Tumivara there are none of the appearances so far as the decorum of civilization. Society seems to have been shattered to pieces. Huts of the most wretched possible description were made up against the chapel walls. Low, without ventilation, room, or any one convenience fit for human habitations, some of them not five feet square. Now Ignatius O'Leary was the local relieving officer at the time, and he was there on that day. He came to have given them as much provisions as the Board of Guardians were permitting to. And when he walked up as far beyond the church up to Feather Street, he saw the remains of the knocked huts there. And he asked locals where the former inhabitants had gone. And they told him they had left the village the day before and were now in the ditches in the adjacent townlands, wherever a drying up or an overhanging tree afforded a favourable situation for re erecting a hut. <coughs> So after that, when the clearance obviously was huge, one of the biggest definitely probably Tipperary, it was reported at various levels. Um, the Tipperary Vindicator, as I've shown the quotations from them, they strongly condemned it. The Nina Guardian, well, at the time that was a much more conservative pro government type publication, and they actually went as far as saying the clearance was really the proper course of action. They said the people of Tumigara were vile characters, the place had got into a most disorganised condition and Mr. Dawson never received any rent. On a national level, it was reported in the Freeman's Journal, and even reached in England, where it was reported in the Times. 
they said it was one of the most sweeping clearances of tenantry that has yet been reported in the annals of Southern evictions. The matter was even discussed in the House of Commons, where Francis Scully, who was the MP for Tipperary at the time, raised the subject of who would take the steps to provide for those who had been evicted. Now, relief efforts seem to have been fairly limited. The parish priest called the matter went to Dublin immediately after the clearance, and he got £20 from the Dublin General Relief Committee for the poor of the area. He also sent a letter to the poor law commissioners urging them to provide temporary workhouse accommodation near Tumi Barra um, for those who have been evicted. So about two weeks after that, um, the poor law union, they took a house at Groan in Tumi Barra just as a temporary measure to provide shelter for those who were evicted. And about 120 people sheltered there in what was described as the direst confusion and most disgusting disorder. It was reported that many of them who didn't stay on in the halls, kind of left the area. People would think, well, they would spend a lot of people looking to money go on as well. Um, 40 or more applied for outdoor relief, but this was refused. At the time, Charles Byron Pony's um, coaches used to stop in Tumimara on the Dublin delivery route, and they changed horses in Tumimara. And often, uh, it was common for the passengers to get off the coaches and walk up to the village, and they seemingly often give some relief or money to the people in the bus. Uh, Thomas Tracy remarked as well that as it was coming up to harvest time shortly after, the people were, the inhabitants of the huts were able to provide just the very necessary to keep body and soul together. So after the clearance then, the life continued for many local farmers in the area as normal. The fair in Tumihara went ahead only four days after the clearance, and it was reported the following month another fair took place there. Um, it's evident as well throughout the district there were plenty of farmers who would stop and produce to sell and life really did continue for them pretty normally while others were living in their huts against the church. Yeah. So as I said, many people left the area. The rest of them were living in huts against the church and uh, they lived there until February the following year, so nearly eight months of it. And after eight months of surviving like this, they were soon to face their next crisis, the hut tumbling. So some of the huts were built on grounds which was used for used on fair days in Tumibara. And John Donahue, who was the under agent, he collected the tolls on fair days. And uh, as the huts were affecting the toll income, he took, took it upon himself to tumble these huts. So he came to do this also on, under the authority of Matthew Dawson, and he said Father Matter, the local priest, was also in favour of it. So on the morning of the 20th of February, he called in a number of local men, about 30 of them. They were all tenants on the Matthew Dawson estate to come to his house. Now it's not certain whether they, they came voluntarily or if they were coerced into it. They were all tenants on the Matthew Dawson estate, so he would have had considerable influence over them. So when they arrived at his house in the village, which is now Josie Maloney's, for any people know it, um, John Hill provided them with whiskey. He sent one of the group up to the huts to tell the inhabitants to give up possession peaceably. But obviously this didn't happen. So at about two o'clock he led the group of men up, up the street to the church. And uh, Thomas Tracy recalled, the town was deserted. There were some four men, some women, and a lot of boys, girls, and children present. Dunham was supposed to have called on these men to stand, raise up stones, and follow him, and tumble the huts in spite of any man in Tipperary. So they went about knocking them. And one of the men who lived in one of the huts at the time was Johnny Gavin. And uh, he had a fight with John Dunham, and a scythe that he owned was used. So Dunham claimed that Gavin tried to cut his head off at the side. When others got involved, a scourge took place, and at this stage the local police intervened. Gavin claimed Dunham met him first and vice versa. And afterwards, Dunham and each of the other men that had been involved brought a case of grievous assault against Gavin. So Gavin in the, during the court case, he claimed that the men were drunk when they arrived at the huts, and the local constable, Constable King, testified and said, they appeared excited and almost in a drunken state. They appeared as if they were after drinking. I consider it was not proper of Dunham to bring men in an excited and drunken state to tumble those ones. So King at the time stated, Dunham was a very decent man. He also said Gavin was a hard-working young man, and the case was returned to the Curtis Quarter Sessions. Now, Dunham was reprimanded for giving whiskey to the for giving whiskey to the group and the event said it was highly improper of him. And Gavin was bound to keep the peace because Dunham claimed that on my own I am afraid of being shot in the street by Gavin and the other evicted tenants. But Dunham was out of the way, he managed to clear all the books and those families were once again left with nowhere to go eight months later. 
And as I said, it's not clear if those who took part were coerced into it or if they did it voluntarily. Um, their best interest would have been served by keeping in Dunham and Wilson's favour. They could possibly have been trying to avoid the same fate themselves. Um, but it is clear, however, they enjoyed a few drinks that morning at Dunham's house. So whether it was applied on his behalf to get them to do these dirty work or whether they did so willingly is uncertain. Now, Tom Streetsy recalled that his own father had been offered a place in Tumi Bar and he was like tumble the house, but he refused. And as a result, they were forced to leave Tumi Bar and they moved to McGall. Now, the incident was remembered for a long time afterwards in the memory of parishioners. And for a few generations, the, family, the, the families of those who were involved in clearing the huts were known as the hut tumblers. Now, um, so those who had been, the huts had been knocked and those had left. Uh, there was about 20 of them, anyway, that lived in them, uh, in the huts, and it's believed globally many of them at that stage moved to money Hall as well. By 1906, um, it was remarked that it was unusual that there were only a few of the hut tumblers and their families remaining in the parish. Um, one of them had been forced to leave his farm and moved to a farm nearby for quality land. One of them kept his farm and his family lived there for generations. A direct descendant of the Dunahoos recently returned to Ireland and he was trying to trace his ancestors. And he was pretty shocked about what he found out, as you can imagine. Um, he actually sent a letter to the Nina Garage and detailing the experience and he said, what was uncovered did shock me, you cannot choose your ancestor. And his first ancestor he went to Australia around 1852 and it was John Dunham, the son of John Dunham, the under agent. But he was never known to talk about his family or where they came from, so that was why they were particularly curious to find out more about him. But after the hot tumbling, John Dunham continued to life as normal and held a lot of influence in the area. <coughs> Later that year, he was uh, reported as being the under agent of the estate, the postmaster of the village, the pound keeper, he owned a shop and ran a lodging house. <coughs> now, throughout that year as well, there were some other incidences and disturbances, and none of them anywhere near as large as the for the hot tumbling. A couple of days after the clearance in Tumi Bar, there was an eviction in Hill and Finch where over 30 were evicted. A couple of months later, five families were evicted in Matra. And as well, there was a couple of incidents which were kind of interesting, and they kind of showed that some people in the area, where they came together to help each other out in hard times. One example was in September 1849. A man had been evicted from his farm in Balmaki. Now, he obviously had a uh, crop of wheat, which he was about to, um, to harvest at the time. So a few days after the eviction, his son and a group of about 50 men went to the farm and cut down about an acre and a half of the wheat. And the bailiff on the estate caught them and called the police and there was a fight, but the men managed to get away with some of the wheat. Um, in October 1849, a bailiff in Tumibara seized some animals and machinery for non-payment of rent and he put them in the pound of Tumibara, which was run by the one and only John Dunhu. And he was about to sell these when a large crowd assembled at the pound. The um, keeper opened the gate and let the stock be taken away. So it's not sure who owned the animals or the equipment, but obviously they were the And lastly, um, in October, 17 cattle were seized from the lands of the John Hunt for non payment of rent, and they were impounded at Kennedy's County Hill and Finch. But the cattle didn't actually belong to Hunt, but to a cousin of his, and they'd just been grazing on his land. So before dawn, a few days later, the owner of the cattle and other locals went to the pound, and they broke it open and released the cattle. So when they were driving them away, they had the misfortune to meet uh, Patrick Kennedy, who was a brother of the pound owners. Now it was reported that the group assaulted him and robbed a pistol from him. And uh, this was reported to the police in Latra as well as the breakout. So uh, some police and the Kennedys took after the group and trying to find the cattle. So they got as far as Clan Cannon, and that would be about up there on six miles away from the pound, where they came across the cattle, but there was no sign of anyone else at all. So Michael Kennedy and the started to round up the cattle when all of a sudden they were attacked by flying stones coming from behind ditches and houses. So the police fired but they realised they were well outnumbered and they left the scene and the cattle weren't recovered afterwards. So I'll just move on then to kind of the last years of the famine. Um, 1850 is often viewed as the marker for the end of it and what, but things were gradually improving in the area at this time. There was still huge hardship and destitution. Um, in March 1850, there were over 3,500 people in the workhouse in Nina. This continued right into the following year, 1851. A woman from Kikiri, Mary Corbin, was found dead from starvation on the side of the road in February. Um, small scale crime and disturbances continued. There was high immigration, and throughout 1850, numerous advertisements appeared 
from offering opportunities to go to Australia. Nina Workhouse had actually, through between 1849 and 1852, they did send three groups of um, girls, of well, Rockwell, young girls, they, most of them were orphans, to Australia. And of the first group of 40 that left, five of them men were from Tumi Barra. So throughout that year, 1850, it was reported there were symptoms of flight in a few districts locally, but for the most part, the cops were fine. Now, in 1851, Matthew Do Reverend Matthew Dawson uh, died, and Captain Dawson, his brother, became the new owner of the estate. Now, it was reported when he came to Tumi Barra in 1851, tar barrels were lighted, and he was surrounded by all his tenants who cheered him loudly and exhibited towards him other tokens of respect and esteem as a kind and good landlord. Now, it was also reported he gave reductions in rent to many and helped send more to, to, to America. So, that was that. I'm going to do it. Just one then we need to look at the <coughs> So, if you look at that table there, really the grim realities of the effect of the famine and the parish are fairly clear. In the 10 year period between 1841 and 1851, the population of the parish declined by over 42%. That's the parish there, the most highlighted in the colour. So, when you compare this to what happened in the, bar in, uh, the barony or in the county, like Upper Ormond had a loss of population in nearly 30% of nearly 30%, and Tipperary nearly 26%. So to Mugara fared much worse than that. Of the civil parishes that make up to Mugara, Kilkerry, Latra, and Amadal, Balamaki, Temple Downey, um, you can see Anamadal had the highest number um, or the highest decrease in people with 2,194. Sorry, the population had declined by 43%. But Kilkerry itself had the highest percentage decrease. And immigration in the years after the famine from Tipperary continued at a very high rate. Between 1851 and 1855, just under 60,000 people emigrated from, from the county. And the housing situation, that changed drastically as well between 1841 and 1851. The number of inhabited houses decreased by 42%. So, similar enough to the population decline, and Amadal had the, um, the highest number of decreases in houses, but Kilkerry had the highest percentage. So, in one area like Kilkerry, almost 60% of houses disappeared in that 10 year period. But now, the fact that so many houses did actually disappear, it either shows they were purposely cleared or else they were of such an unsubstantial nature <coughs> when people left and did disintegrate it um, immediately. So it just goes to prove the high, well highlighted point that it was the poorest in society, the landless labour, the cottier, those, they were the ones who were the most affected by the famine and they were practically wiped out. Um, in 1850, the average value of a house in the parish was £1.14. Now, a house of this value was far superior to the typical fourth class house that, um, that accounted for over 55% of houses in Tumi Bar in 1841. So the fate of those who lived in the poorest type of housing was really limited to one of three options. They either died, migrated to another area, or immigrated. Now, as you know, immigration was really only an option for those who could afford it. And, uh, while it may be easier to imagine that the inhabitants had just migrated to another area, as Desmond Land in his study in Celtic said, unfortunately the reality is more likely to be found in the famine graveyards. So for those that did survive, they were often in a better position than they had been before the famine. They were now part of a smaller population, they didn't face the same competition for land or housing. Um, the average size of a farm in the parish in 1850 was just over 35 acres. This was substantially higher than the average land holding of 15 to 20 acres before the famine. So one could argue that those land holders in Chilly Barn survived the famine, they had higher quality houses and they had larger farms. Now, as well as that, um, deaths, you know, and the famine's effect on the population has been well examined. But another area to look at is indirect deaths. So this is like deaths due to the disruption of normal operation of society. One of the things would be births that would have occurred if the famine hadn't intervened. And if you look at Tumi Barra, um, between 1832 and 1835, there was an average of about 309 Catholic baptisms each year. But in the following 10 years, there was an average number of 153. So a decrease of over 50%. 
and the parish records for Tunivar and the U.S. prior to the famine show a wide variety of surnames. But after the famine, many of these disappeared. There's 187 surnames that are in the records before the famine that never appear again in the records for the rest of the 19th century. So finally, I'd just like to say a few words on the legacy of the on the legacy of the famine. Cecil Hood of Smith, she said, The famine left hatred behind. Between Ireland and England, the memory of what was done and endured has lain like a sword. But as well as hatred towards the English administration and landlords for their lack of help, there was a lot of bitterness felt towards um, those Irish who were in a position to help or maybe could have done more but didn't. The bitterness was often felt towards those who took advantage of the predicament that others found themselves in. As I mentioned earlier, the average farm size in Chimibara was much higher after the famine than before. Many were able to secure larger holdings by taking on land from which others had left or had been evicted. And even in the 1930s, this was still remembered with some bitterness. <coughs> taking a quote from the Irish Folklore Commission um, that was taken from Gertigari School, and uh, what someone said was, During and after the famine, the greater part of the land, especially the big farms, changed hands. The owners were evicted and no locals would be got to take their lands. These then fell into the possession of imported bailiffs and grabbers, and it's their descendants who now possess the big farms of our parish. But the origin of these people is not forgotten. They lack the respect which goes to the poor descendants still living in hovels, of these people who kept their name and their honour and their loyalty to their neighbours in those evil days of famine and eviction. Um, as I said earlier, local families who took farms from which others were evicted, they were often victims of threatening attacks or threatening notices. Other tactics were also adopted by locals. Um, some families might be boycotted or their stock wouldn't have been bought at fairs or markets. Now, bitterness to Wilson, that, was, that remained on in for many years after that. Um, the, there was a number of planned attempts on his life, but none of these actually were carried out. And 80 years after the clearance, he was still openly regarded as the villain and his name reviled throughout the area. In the 1930s, he was described as, A tyrannical Wilson wrought havoc on the village of Tumivara. He reduced it to one third of its size. So even to this day, many, many would still know the name Wilson and his role in the clearance. And testimony, testimony to the hatred and bitterness felt towards him is seen in the stories and kind of folklore that surround his death. When he died, his flesh was said to have melted away, and he was a mass of corrupt matter, so that he could scarcely be coffined. <laughs> but whatever about legacy and folklore of it all, the facts speak for themselves, really. And the stark reality is that in Chumibara, over 42% of the population disappeared during the famine. And I'm going to finish up with a quote from Thomas Tracy, who, over 50 years after the famine, said, When my mind goes back to these years, as I pen these lines, I scarcely can do so as my eyes fill and my heart beats at the recollection. So that's it. I hope that gives you
not in not in too far anything that I come across anyway. I'm trying to say we can, you know, many exhibitions or anything like that there. Many of the accounts that were um, written about the public works that were carried out, it was just mm -hmm. that that the you know, like dikes and you know, bridges were built to that fish. You mentioned there any wrong, you don't know, no course or anything. Oh yeah, it was low, lowering a hill, like lowering a hill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. No. And I say to you something about immigration. I was living in Canada for over 20 years. I was a cross island. You probably know about that. And it's on Golden In 1847, you know how many immigrants from Ireland came over there? 126. You know how many died there? 43,000. Not counted the ones, but they threw over four. You know? Up to 1950, uh, 1850, 80, over 80,000 Irish people died over in Canada. I bought that book from Settler Pinta. You know that, great book. I bought it in 1962 on Cross Island. Did you ever heard about that? The big country cross. You know what that says? On both sides, it's written on the you should read that. Thank you. I'd like to ask if there's any particular reason why the poor people to be to take shelter inside the church at that wet day. I often wonder that myself. Um, there's no reports or accounts of it. I can only imagine maybe whether it wasn't allowed at the time or it wasn't offered to them. It's just sad, isn't it?
How did it end, then, with, say, if potatoes had not been destroyed by blight, what did they use for seed potatoes? And why did the, why did the blight end? <laughs> 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 well, I know um, from looking at the papers, you know, the garden and that, they would have reported that seed potatoes were for sale at the market for, you know, were going for however much. So, I don't know where they were brought from, but there obviously was people who were bored them spraying to plant, you know. But did they start spraying or something then that they in there or what happened? Sometimes it's over here, who's going? Well, it's okay, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's Somebody needs to contribute 
First, I would urge you to take your time getting out of this room, because uh, that's going to be a bit of an obstacle, and uh, stay your room. And again, on your behalf, we thank Helen. Thank you.